party. We're invited, everyone. Come along to the party. Jesus welcomes everyone. Hey, it's our job at party time. Help everyone join in. When poor ones, hurt ones, know God's love, the partying begins. Come along to the party. We're invited, everyone. Come along to the party. Jesus welcomes everyone. More than inviting those whose lives are different to you and me. God wants us to make them honored guests, as special as can be. Come along, come along to the party. party. We're invited, We're invited. Everyone. everyone. Come along, come along. to the party. party. Jesus welcomes Jesus everyone. Welcomes Jesus welcomes everyone. Jesus welcomes everyone. Jesus welcomes everyone. Jesus does welcome everyone. And we see the light of Christ, the candle reminding us that Jesus is with us here in this place. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Lord, Lord, Lord. Creator God, you call us to hospitality. You give us, gen give us to give us generosity, generously sorry, to others as you have given to us. Loving God, you call us to give you glory in the compassion we show to one another, to love without judgment of ourselves or of others. We gather as one body, seeking to walk in the way that you have set for us. We gather as one body to worship the one who is love. Let us pray. Hospitable God, you invite us to a banquet where the last may be first and the humble and the mighty trade places. Let us share your abundance with no fear of scarcity. Let us welcome strangers as if we are welcoming you. Send your spirit so that we may find a place at your table and welcome others with radical hospitality. In the name of Jesus, guest at all of our tables, we pray. Amen. So let us stand if we're able and sing our first song, All Are Welcome.
and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us share God's peace and God's welcome with all. Those who are young and young at heart, I'm going to read a story this morning. It's a Dr. Seuss story by the name of Yertle the Turtle. Have you heard this story before? Yertle the Turtle? Okay. Let me find the right part of my iPad. And ah, there it is. On the far away island of Salamisond, Yertle the turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond, it was clean, it was neat. The water was warm, there was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need, and they were all happy, quite happy indeed. They were, until Yertle, the king of them all, Decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said Yertle, of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. With this stone for a throne, I look down on my pond, but I, can't, I cannot look down on the places beyond. This throne that I sit on is too small, too low down. It ought to be higher, he said with a frown. If I could sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king I'd be, a ruler of all I could see. So Yertle the turtle lifted his hand, and Yertle the turtle, king, gave a command. He ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone, and use these turtles. And using these turtles, he built a new throne. He made each turtle stand on another one's back, and he piled them all up in a nine turtle stack. And then Yertle climbed up. He sat down on the pile. What a wonderful view! He could see almost a mile. All mine, yelled, cried, or Yertle cried. Oh, the things I now rule. I'm king of a cow and I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a house and what's more beyond that, I'm king of a blueberry bush and a cat. I'm Yertle the turtle. Oh, marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. And all through the morning he sat there up high, saying over and over, a great king am I, until, around, until round about noon he heard a faint sigh. What's that? snapped the king. And he looked down the stack, and he saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac. Just a part of his throne, and this plain little turtle looked up and he said, Beg your pardon, King Yertle. I've pains in my back and my shoulders and knees. How long must we stand here, your majesty, please? Silence! The king of the turtles barked back, I'm king and you're only a turtle named Mac. You say, you stay in your place. I'll get the right thing. You stay in your place while I sit here and rule. I'm king of a cow and I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a house and a bush and a cat. But that isn't all. I'll do better than that. My throne shall be higher, his royal voice thundered. So pile up more turtles. I want about 200 Turtles, more turtles, he bellowed and brayed, and the turtles way down in the pond were afraid. They trembled, they shook, 
But they came, they obeyed from all over the pond. They came swimming by dozens, whole families of turtles with uncles and cousins. All of them stepped on the head of poor Mac. One after another, they climbed up the stack. Then Yertle the turtle was perched up so high, he could see 40 miles from his throne in the sky. Hooray, shouted Yertle, I'm king of the trees, I'm king of the birds, I'm king of the bees. I'm king of the butterflies, king of the air. Ah me, what a throne, what a wonderful chair. I'm Yertle the turtle, oh marvellous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. Then again from below, in a great heavy stack, came a groan from that plain little turtle named Mac. Your Majesty, please, I don't like to complain, but down here below we are feeling great pain. I know up on top you are seeing great sights, but down at the bottom we too should have rights. We turtles can't stand it. Our shells will all crack. Besides, we need food. We are starving, groaned Mac. You hush up your mouth, howled the mighty King Yertle. You know right to talk to the world's highest turtle. I rule from the clouds over land, over sea. There's nothing, no nothing that's higher than me. But while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon of, of the evening was starting to rise up over his head in the darkening skies. What's that? Shouted, snorted Yertle. What is that thing that dares to be higher than Yertle the king? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can and I will. I call, I, I'll call some more turtles and stack them to heaven. I'll need about 5,607. But as Yertle the turtle lifted his hand and started to order and give a command, that plain little turtle below in the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just Mac, decided he'd taken enough and he had. And that plain little turtle got a little bit mad and that plain little Mac did a plain little thing. He burped and his burp shook the throne of the king. And Yertle the turtle, the king of the trees, the king of the air and the birds and the bees, the king of a house and a cow and a mule. Well, that was the end of, king, of Turtle King's rule. For Yertle the king of all Salamisond fell off his high throne and fell plonk in the pond. And today the great Yertle, the marvellous he, is king of the mud. That's all he can see. And the turtles, of course, or the turtles are free, and turtles and may, as turtles and maybe, or creatures, should be. The end. So, Jesus in our story today, you'll get to hear, tells a parable. He talks about people trying to find their best place around the table at a dinner party, trying to get the best seats, the seats that are closest to the host are the best seats, places them higher than other people at the table. A bit like Yertle, isn't it, really? He wanted to be higher than everybody else, and so he pushed his way to the very top. Sometimes we can be a bit like that too, can't we? Trying to get ahead of everybody else especially if there are yummy treats like cake and lollies and biscuits involved, or if we're trying to be picked first in a sports team, or maybe if we want the teachers to pick us first to answer the question, or, or if we don't want to take our turn at the shops and try and push ahead of everybody else. But if we do that, we might actually hurt other people, like Yertle did to poor old Mac and all the other turtles. And that's not a good thing. Jesus and Yertle remind us that we shouldn't hurt others if we are trying to get ahead. It's better to be patient and to wait our turn and to help others to be kind to others as we wait our turn. And that way, no one will miss out. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you do want us all to, to participate. You want us all to get the most out of life because that's who you are. You want to share your love with, with us and you want us to share your love with everybody. And so, Lord God, help us to do that. When we think we are more deserving than others, help remind us that we are all deserving the same and that we all do receive the same. We receive all of your love. Thank you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so let us sing a song. When I needed a neighbor, were you there?
come before God with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, you call us and we ignore your whisper, listening to the voices of this world. You call us and we choose a different path, following our own devices. You call us to be your voice in this world to be your hands in this world, to be your feet in this world, to proclaim your peace, your comfort, your forgiveness, your healing, your love, and your grace. Forgive us, God. Open our ears and call us again and use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the good news through what God has done for us, that we are new people, forgiven and embraced and welcomed by God. And so we offer our open hearts and serving hands to everyone we meet. Thanks be to God. Russell, would you like to bring us our Bible reading? All right, there you are. Thanks, Russell. Our first reading today is from the book of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 14, verses 1, and then verse 7 to 14. On one occasion when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honour, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honour in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to, one, to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbours, in case they may invite you in return, and you would thus be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Our second reading today is from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 1 to 8, and then 15 and 16. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them those who are being tortured as though yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honour by all and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. 
Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the word of the Lord. Dinner parties can be fun, can't they? I do enjoy attending a dinner party where I, along with the, the host and the other guests, get to eat a, a delicious meal and, and have great conversations. I've always found them to be wonderful times of fellowship as we come together to do what all people must do, and, and that is to eat. And for me, eating with others, especially with friends and family, is far better than eating by myself. Dinner parties, though, don't always go well. And searching the internet, thank you, Google, for disastrous, funny dinner party stories, some, and also some really humorous ones as well, I can't say that I've experienced some of these, these situations that I read in these stories that I searched on, but many others have, and there are way too many stories to mention here. I'm surprised, though, that those who do share these stories are willing to do so, for some of them are really embarrassing. Stories about undercooked and overcooked food, of, of those who've substituted salt for sugar or sugar for salt in desserts, of, of conflict between guests and the consumption of, of way too much alcohol or wine, and also inappropriate dinner conversations, among many other stories. I mean, thank goodness for the anonymity of the internet, where guest identities can be hidden and the author can remain unnamed. Probably the funniest story, though, I read in my deep dive into dinner party disasters is this one. A family was having some people over for dinner. At the table, the mother turned to her six-year-old daughter and said, Dear, would you like to say the blessing? I wouldn't know what to say, replied the little girl shyly. Just say what you've heard mummy say, sweetie, she said to her mother. You could see where this is going, can't you? Her daughter took a deep breath, bowed her head and solemnly said, Dear Lord, why did I invite all these people to dinner? <laughs> so Jesus is no stranger to dinner parties either. In Luke's Gospel, this is the third invitation to a meal that Jesus accepts from a Pharisee, though not all the dinner parties that Jesus attends are friendly or even cordial, for they usually ended in some form of controversy or confrontation between Jesus and the host and the guests, as was the case for this meal. And I wonder if this is why the Pharisees and the scribes who were also at this meal were suspicious of Jesus. Stories about Jesus would have preceded his arrival in this village. And so perhaps they were expecting Jesus to do or say something that was radical, something that challenged their authority, something that called into question their understanding of scripture, something that highlighted their legalism and sometimes ungraciousness in following, in following the law. Of course, we must be careful not to paint all Pharisees and scribes with the same brush. Though some of them did try to trip Jesus up on matters of theology and law, and some were critical of Jesus when he healed on the Sabbath, and some were threatened by his authority, others weren't, weren't so antagonistic towards Jesus. Some were even amazed by Jesus' teachings and actions, and some warned Jesus that Herod Antipas was searching for him so that he might kill him. And so it would not have been unusual for Jesus to be invited to dine at the home of a leader of the Pharisees. And it demonstrated that Jesus was viewed, at least by some of the Pharisees and other religious leaders of the day, with regard and even possibly respect and admiration. And so while Jesus was on his way to the home of the leader of the Pharisees on the Sabbath, accompanied by Pharisees and other religious leaders who, who were watching him closely, 
in the verses that our reading omits, Jesus did something that justified their suspicion, for he encountered a man who was suffering from edema. Of course, in the same way as, as we heard about in last week's passage, Jesus didn't hesitate to heal the man, even though it was the Sabbath. And in much the same way as he did in last week's passage while in the synagogue, he challenged the Pharisees and, and the others' indignation by asking them if they would not immediately save their own child or an ox who had fallen into the well on the Sabbath day. Of course, they would have. And so the Pharisees and others wouldn't reply to Jesus' challenge. It is then that Jesus arrives at the Pharisees' home and, and, and he observes how the guests behave as they jostle for the best seats at the table, the ones that were closest to the host, thus establishing the social hierarchy for the meal. After seeing this all take place, Jesus tells them a parable, a story about a wedding banquet where a guest inappropriately sits at the table in a place that is higher than his status allows. And so he is forced to humble himself by being moved by the host to the lowest place at the table. But if a guest takes the lowest place at the table, a place that is below where that guest ought to be, then the host will move that guest to a higher place at the table in front of everybody who's there. It is a lesson of humility in which Jesus reminds his fellow dinner guests that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. A lesson that really went against the norm of society and culture, where status and position were commodities that allowed its holder to exercise authority and power over those who did not have them. Commodities that were costly and so weren't to be given up lightly. But the lesson doesn't end there. For Jesus has a lesson for the host of the meal as well. He tells the one who invited him that, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your rich relatives or rich neighbours in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the cripple, the lame and the blind. Jesus goes on saying that the, to the host that he will be blessed because those who he invites cannot repay him, but he will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Of course, this is a lesson that we've all heard Jesus tell before, haven't we? Care for those who are poor, who are crippled, who are lame, and who are blind. Essentially, anyone who is in need, anyone who is in need, for this is at the center of, of the gospel, especially in Luke's gospel. And it is a lesson that would have been difficult for those receiving it for, to hear for the first time, for, for it challenged those with, with wealth and a status and authority to give that up to let go of what they perceive make them who they are and what their identity is, and then to offer it to those who had no wealth and who had no status, who had no authority, those who were considered to be unworthy. It was and is a radical hospitality, and it turned on its head the social and cultural conventions that were ingrained in their society and in their world. Of course, this is a lesson for us as well. Jesus challenges us too to, to give up anything that we hold of value, our status and wealth and authority, including our honoured seat at the table if it interferes with caring for those who are poor and in need. But what might that look like? Well, to answer this question, I would like to read you a story and its accompanying commentary uh, from the book that is written by Peter Rowlands. And the book is entitled The Orthodox Heretic and Other Impossible Tales. This story is titled, Salvation for a Demon. In the centre of a once great city, there stood a magnificent cathedral that was cared for by a kindly old priest who spent his days praying in the vestry and caring for the poor. As a result of the priest's tireless work, the cathedral was known throughout the land as a true sanctuary. The priest welcomed all who came to his door and gave completely without prejudice or restraint. Each stranger was to the priest a neighbour in need and thus, and thus the incoming of Christ. His hospitality was famous and his heart was known to be pure. No one could steal from this old man for he considered no possession his own and while thieves sometimes left that place with items pillaged from the sanctuary, the priest never grew concerned. He had given everything to God and knew that these people needed such items more than the church did. 
Early one evening in the middle of winter, while the priest was praying before the cross, there was a loud and ominous knock at the cathedral door. The priest quickly got to his feet and went to the entrance as he knew it would be a terrible night and the re any reason that the visitor might be in need of shelter. Upon opening the door, he was surprised to find a terrifying demon towering over him with large dead eyes and rotting flesh. Old man, the demon hissed, I have traveled many miles to seek your shelter. Will you welcome me in? Without hesitation, the priest bid this hideous demon welcome and beckoned him into the church. The evil demon stooped down and stepped across the threshold, spitting venom onto the tiled floor as he went. In full view of the priest, the demon proceeded to tear down the various icons that adorned the walls and rip the fine linens that hung around the sanctuary while screaming blasphemy and curses. During this time, the priest knelt silently on the floor and continued his devotions until it was time for him to retire for the night. Old man, cried the demon, where are you going now? I'm returning home to rest, for it has been a long day, replied the kindly priest. May I come with you, spat the demon. I too am tired and in need of a place to lay my head. Why, of course, replied the priest, come and I will prepare a meal. On returning to his house, the priest prepared some food while the evil demon mocked the priest and broke the various religious artifacts that adorned his humble dwelling. The demon then ate the meal and was provided, that was provided and afterwards turned his attention to the priest. Old man, you welcome me first into your church and then into your house. I have one more request for you. Will you now welcome me into your heart? Why, of course, said the priest. What I have is yours and what, what I am is yours. This heartfelt response brought the demon to a standstill for by giving everything, the priest had retained the very thing that the demon sought to take. For the demon was unable to rob him of his kindness and his hospitality, his love and his compassion. And so the great demon left in defeat, never to return. What happened to that demon after this meeting with the elderly priest is anyone's guess. Some say that although he left the place empty-handed, he received more than he could ever have imagined. And the priest, he simply ascended his stairs, got into bed and drifted off to sleep, all the time wondering what guise his Christ would take next. And here's Peter's commentary. The first thing to note about this story is that it expresses an impossible hospitality. A hospitality that flings open its doors to anyone without condition. In contrast to this, our own hospitality is conditional and generally extended only to those who we like or those who will abide by certain rules and etiquette. Our hospitality is often little more than self-interested exchange where we invite some people to our house for our own pleasure. There are conditions to our hospitality, conditions that include politeness, respect, and a nice bottle of wine. While there's nothing wrong with such a situation, the radical, impossible hospitality spoken of by Christ is one that goes infinitely further than this. It is a hospitality that opens the doors to those who are not part of our friendship circle, those who are not likely to bring us gifts or respect, or respect our sensibilities. This view of hospitality resonates with Jesus' view of love, a love that asks us to do more than simply embrace those who love us, something that even the most heartless criminals do. It asks us to embrace those who are indifferent to us or who even despise us. This is wonderfully expressed in Jesus' description of a wedding feast in which the doors of the party are open to passers-by, to anyone who would want to come. This radical hospitality manifests itself as an unconditional gift rather than as a conditional exchange. Here the outsiders are welcomed in, the excluded are the ones who are included. This type of hospitality will strike us as utterly impossible and even offensive for a variety of reasons, perhaps because we selfish, selfishly want to protect our new carpets, or maybe because we selflessly need to protect our family. 
However, it is precisely the impossible nature of divine hospitality that we must bear in mind when we encounter others. For it helps to remind us that we can never pat ourselves on the back and claim that we have been truly hospitable, that we have somehow reflected the radical nature of Christ in our actions. This impossible vision of divine hospitality can also inspire us to act in a more generous and gracious manner than we might otherwise be inclined toward remembering that God has opened the doors to us and that we should endeavour to do the same. To welcome the demon in whatever form the demon takes is all but impossible. But through our trying to show hospitality to the demon at our door, the demon may well be transformed by the grace that is shown. Or we may come to realise that it was not really a demon at all, but just a broken, damaged person like ourselves. Thank you, Peter. Amen. And so we're going to sing another song, a song to reflect what we've heard, a song to remind us that it is God who we are serving. So let us stand and sing, Lord, let me see. <coughs> received so let us freely give our offerings for the Lord
Holy God, we thank you for all that you have given us. Particularly, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. And so, Lord God, we give you in return all that you have given us. Money and resources, but also ourselves. And so, Lord God, we pray that you use these gifts and use us so that all people may know of you and know of your love. We pray in Jesus', we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Jeff, what are we noticing today? As you uh, leave the church this morning, uh, you'll see on the table just outside there, there's the latest edition of uh, Frontier News. It's, uh, it's a little magazine that we get regularly and um, it tells us all about uh, the work of Frontier Services. It's the agency of the Uniting Church that serves the outback and uh, does a wonderful, wonderful work to, uh, for our isolated um, uh, communities uh, in the outback. And over next Sunday and the Sunday after, the, uh, it, our support for Frontier Services uh, will be through our second offering. Um, it's uh, one of, the, one of the, um, the, the agencies of our church that we support with our second offering. And so uh, you might like to take a copy uh, of that uh, little news uh, magazine so that uh, you can learn a little bit more about the work of Frontier Services. Uh, this evening, uh, Cafe Church, uh, five o'clock here. Uh, soup and crusty bread this evening. And uh, so if you haven't let us know you're coming and that you'd like to, there's an opportunity to pop your name down on the list uh, outside there this morning as well. Um, Men's Coffee uh, is on this coming week, uh, Thursday at 10 o'clock at Rosemount. Um, Friday evening we have a Parents' Night Out, Kids' Night In uh, here between 6 and, and 9. Uh, so mums and dads, uh, check in with Craig if you'd like to drop the kids at church and enjoy your evening. Um, but also we'd like some extra help. Uh, we're down a little bit on leadership for uh, par Parents' uh, Night Out, Kids' Night In at the moment. So. Uh, uh, some extra adult assistance uh, would be appreciated. It just means being a caring adult presence um, uh, there. Um, it's a pretty, pretty easy and good night. Uh, you do need to have a blue card. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, offer, offer help, then please let uh, Craig know uh, that you're happy to be a part of that as well. That would be greatly appreciated. Remember the month of September uh, where... Uh, getting together the items for 200 gift bags uh, for uh, shipment to the Philippines in October. Uh, this, will, this will support uh, 200 children in, uh, at a school in the Philippines. Uh, so the items, they're all listed in Centenary Life, but soap, toothbrushes, balls, biros, marbles, children's clothing, and also uh, the packet spaghetti, um, which is a, uh, such a treat for Christmas in the Philippines. So if you'd like to bring those items during the month of September, uh, there's a box at the back of the church for you to leave them in. Uh, that will be fantastic. September, of course, marks spring, and um, so... Uh, Russell thought it'd be a lovely idea if we could have a spring lunch. Um, and uh, so he's booked a number of tables at K&K &K for Sunday the 18th of September. Uh, there are a number of people who are going already, but if you'd like to, uh, to join that group, uh, Sunday the 18th of September uh, for lunch at K&K &K Restaurant, which is at Cinnamon Park in Oldfield Road. Um, next Sunday we'll have the opportunity to pop your name down. Um, and uh, also there'll be uh, um, the menu uh, available for you to have a look at. Uh, you can always check the menu out online, and I will put some details in Centenary Life, um, but uh, bear that in mind um, for uh, Sunday the 18th of September. Uh, it'll be a matter of uh, pay for your own meal, uh, but an opportunity to share together over lunch uh, on Sunday 18 September. Um, now, uh, annual congregational meeting coming up in two weeks' time now, so that's Sunday the 11th of September following morning worship. Uh, you'll receive your annual report uh, today uh, via Centenary Life. So Centenary Life will go out this afternoon, it will have the annual report attached. If you don't receive Centenary Life, there will be some hard copies available uh, next Sunday. Um, you might like to let Russell know if you'd like a hard copy, because that we, we, we don't want to have to print too many. Uh, but for those who don't receive it by Centenary Life, uh, let Russell know, and uh, we'll have a hard copy for you. 
Um, the annual meeting, as I said last Sunday, is uh, very important, so if you could pop that in your diary, we would appreciate it. Um, and it'll be an opportunity to uh, not only adopt the annual report, but also in the budget for, for this year, uh, but also to endorse our mission plan, which you would have received a copy of via um, Centenary Life in uh, this last week. It's also the opportunity to elect and to re-elect elders and representatives to uh, church council and to presbytery. And um, I'd like to let you know that those who are seeking re-election for a further term include uh, Leanne Brown, Russell, uh, Russell Brown, Shane Bretherton, Leslie Colling and Mari Outhwaite. And uh, I'm delighted to tell you that we have um, four nominations uh, for first-time members of church council. Uh, in Paula Curvin, uh, Felicity Fluke, Helen Longwall, and Mark Matthews. Now, if you don't know Mark Matthews, Mark's Lily's dad. So, who looks after our kids there, which he's doing this morning um, uh, with um, uh, activities uh, uh, whilst um, we worship here. So, um, we look forward to those people being elected to our church council. I will thank you forever because of what you have done. In the presence of the faithful, I will proclaim your name, for it is good. Psalm 52, verse 9. Heavenly God, even amidst the storms that cover our lives, we are so grateful. So grateful that you hold us together when we cannot hold ourselves. We thank you for the good things happening in our world, for the artists, poets, musicians, for the leaders who truly care for their people, for the people who will always help their neighbour. We see your beauty in every facet of nature, and dear God, we are truly grateful for your constant reminders that your blessed Holy Spirit is alive and well and moving in the world we live in, your world, dear Father. Dear Lord, at times it feels that there is no hope, that there is no good in the world. But oh, how, do, how we see good in the person who brought us food when we were hungry, for the friend who thought to call, for the thoughtful acts of kindness towards friends and strangers, for the people on the other side of the world who fall on their knees in prayer before you, upholding brother and sister in Christ. We give you praise and thanks, dear Father, that we can celebrate the small, everyday deeds of ordinary folk which keeps darkness at bay. We see the good in a hurting, fragile and broken world, dear Lord, and we join with our brothers and sisters in Christ globally, joining in the prayer of Desmond Tutu. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours through him who loves us. We pray, dear Father, that your goodness, love, light, life and victory would flow like a mighty, raging, renewing and healing river into places of conflict, war, oppression, famine, injustice, poverty, suffering and fear. We pray for the hundreds of millions of people living in countries with war, conflict, violence and fragile internal systems. We know the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated conditions and reversed years of progress in regard to extreme poverty. Father, we pray for your people living with extreme humanitarian needs where children, families and communities struggle to acquire the basic necessities of life. Dear Father, we cry out for peace and stability in Ethiopia and your protection over children and their families. We pray for healing for the beautiful land of Haiti, where children and families are suffering from disasters, natural and man-made. We ask for your comfort, love, goodness and strength. We pray for your heavenly and healing help for the people of Lebanon and Sri Lanka, living with economic crisis, conflict and poverty. 
We lift your people to you in Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala and ask your blessing on those who live in fear and poverty. May they find hope in you and opportunities to pursue education and employment. We pray for your people in Syria who have lost everything to conflict and injustices. May they find peace in you and courage to rebuild their lives and country. Prince of Peace, we pray for the restoration, peace and civility in South Sudan so children can grow into all you intend them to be. Father, we ask for protection for the people of Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, South Sudan, Myanmar, Somalia, Congo, Iraq, Eritrea and Central African Republic who have fled their homes, especially the children, the elderly, and people who are disabled. We ask in your name to restore communities, reunite families, and repair countries. May corrupt authorities and those who perpetrate injustices and war be dismantled and disempowered. And may your Holy Spirit raise up wise, true, and just leadership Father, for all who are persecuted, oppressed and suffering at the hands of others in any way, we pray that your people would feel the healing breath of your blessed Holy Spirit and experience your loving closeness and love. For this beautiful nation we call home, Lord, we pray that we would indeed grow into the great south land of the Holy Spirit. We pray protection over its people, its democracy, its freedoms, and its environment and ecosystems. Father, you love each man, woman, child, and creature, and we would place the Pandora's box of needs, spiritual, emotional, and physical, at your holy feet, your pierced feet. May we learn to walk with you, dear Father, at your pace, according to your will. Bind your people together, loving one, to be patient, and mercifully kind, not envying, boasting, prideful or rude, not selfish, short-fused, score-keeping or spiteful, but rejoicing in the goodness within and around us. We know we need you, gracious God. Remind us that we need one another as well and sustain us together for the work to which you call us today, tomorrow and always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So let us stand and sing once more. Praise and thanksgiving.
To go now and walk in God, all God's ways, showing hospitality to strangers, pray for those who suffer, and do not neglect, neglect to do good. And may God be your strength, may Christ Jesus be your fountain of living water, and may the Holy Spirit raise you to life. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And let us turn to one another as we share the Mispah benediction. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from the other. Amen.